Hello everyone. Let's just make sure that we are streaming and everything is working. I think it is. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'm going to check my audio. Everything looks good. Hey, here we are. Well, hello everyone. I'm recording. Technically, I'm broadcasting. Um, I just figure it's more like I'm I'm recording live or broadcasting live, recording live, whatever. Um, I wanted to make a series of special episodes about Creeksville uh, that's dedicated to teaching just kind of the basics because I get I get a lot of questions about the basics. Uh, how do you play it? Where do you find it? Uh, can I buy the system? Uh, all kinds of questions like that. And so I want to get into those questions and just have a little library of kind of basic videos uh, where I explain to people uh, the, the simple rundown, okay? Uh, first of all, what is Creeksville? What makes something a Creeksville? Uh, where does it come from and all that? Most people kind of know the rough background. They know it's an old, old war game. It's actually the great grandfather of all modern war gamings, uh, introducing a lot of mechanics and ideas that are present in modern day war games. Um, the only war game really that's older than that is probably chess. Uh, there were older versions of games, but as far as games that are actually still played today, Kriegspiel is uh, perhaps second only to chess, which is actually thousands of years old, as, as I understand. But Kriegspiel was developed initially in 1812. Uh, at first it was kind of a novelty. It was like, well, that's really cool, but we're not really sure what to do with it. It underwent a series of revisions. Uh, all throughout the 19th century, and by the end of the 19th century, it was fairly widely used. It kind of had its heyday in the 1860s, 70s, and I think into the 1880s or so, uh, but really the 1860s and 70s was when it was a big deal in Prussia, later Germany, and it was played uh, as a training exercise for officers, and generals might kind of use it to war game certain scenarios to get some sort of insight. Uh, it's still played around the world today, uh, all by most all of the world's militaries, I'm sure. Uh, officers use this still to train. I know at Army University, they play Kriegspiel games to train uh, the cadets or the lieutenants or, and what have you. And a lot of people, you know, they, they want to know what is the fuss about. Kriegspiel is probably the most realistic wargaming experience you can have. That's because it has a human element and it is played double blind against other human players. So whereas other war games feature sort of this, um, maybe you're playing, uh, you have a rule book and you know the rules. You've got hexes, you got hex sides, you got terrain. You have all of these artificial contrivances to simulate reality. And then you have a turn system where I go, you go, you go, I go, whatever. Sometimes uh, they mix it up with impulse and initiative roles and things like that. Uh, but ultimately, you take turns. Uh, you have stacks of units. And even if you can't inspect the stacks of units in a modern war game, you can usually tell by the thickness of the stack. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Recovering from a cold. You can usually tell from the thickness of a stack and so on and other metagame uh, circumstances what you're dealing with you know and you see where things are on the board even if it's a small stack or a big stack or whatever it may be you more or less know what your opponent is doing because you see the whole board in front of you Kriegspiel takes all of that away from you to create fog of war so you have a red team you have a blue team the red team and the blue team both issue orders to an umpire the umpire then moves the pieces and then resolves anything that should happen, such as any kind of combat or anything like that. Then the umpire gives reports to both players, telling you, here's what happened. Here's what you see. And the umpire may place blocks on your map to illustrate what you see, may take things away. Uh, even friendly forces will be added or taken away from your view based on whether or not your avatar or your officer in the field could see them. And that enhances the fog of war experience. Then, of course, there's one more thing, which is delayed order implementation. 
So you give an order, the order isn't always instantly obeyed. If you send a communication to someone else, that communication takes time to arrive. And the umpire will actually calculate how long does it take for this message to arrive and will deliver the message on the appropriate turn. So you can see why Kriegspiel creates this kind of fog of war atmosphere and why everybody wants to play it. Now, the original Kriegspiel was actually not designed to be played as a game. It was designed as a military training exercise. It was not intended to be fun, no more fun than basic training is intended to be for soldiers. We might think, hey, you know, going out in the dirt and shooting a machine gun at the bad guys or the other team, whatever it may be, uh, maybe it's paintballs or whatever, that might be a lot of fun. And I suppose there is fun if you're doing it for fun. Uh, but once it comes time to settle down and eat rations or build camp or clean your weapon or go to the bathroom or, and you have to do this for day after day after day in, you know, hot heat or freezing cold and there's bugs and other things, it gets old really fast, right? It's not really that fun. Kriegspiel, unfortunately, is kind of the same way. It's a very slow moving game. The umpires did a lot of work to speed things up the people who developed the game uh, they revised the rules many times over in fact in the 1880s they got so sick of the rules because they thought the rules were actually slowing things down and interfering uh, plus technology was changing so the rules constantly had to be updated the combat tables had to be updated and all that so what they had to do was basically throw all of that out and say we're going to play a system called free creek spill where the umpire just plays God and says, here's what's going on, this is how many casualties, and so on, and, and just, did, they even did away with dice, so the umpire could decide how effective one side firing at the other side was. And what we've learned from that is what makes Kriegspiel fun is not all of the minutia that we think makes wargaming fun. See, we think what makes wargaming fun is having, um, you know, this unit here armed with more powerful weapons clashing with this unit here with inferior weapons and they're going to use some kind of terrain advantage to make up the difference or whatever and, and so on, right? And war gamers try to find these clever combinations to defeat their opponents. But that's not really what makes war gaming fun. That's accounting. That's rules lawyering and things like that. That's what a lot of war gamers like to do. Kriegsfield takes that away from you. You just don't have that kind of control over your units. Uh, certainly not in the modern forms of Kriegspiel that we play. And even in the original rules, your control is kind of limited. So what we do is uh, we, what we've done is we've taken the original rules, which were kind of unwieldy and filled with a lot of minutia. And we take that away and we wipe it away. Basically, we figured out how to gamify Kriegspiel. Because if you try to play original Kriegspiel rules, you'll find that it's unplayable. It's not that you can't run it. You can run it, but you don't have enough hours in a day to run a full-blown engagement. You might be able to do a small-scale tactical battle, especially if your umpire knows the, um the rules really, really well. But you're not going to refight Waterloo in 4, 5, or 6 hours, or even 8, 10, or 12 hours. It's just not going to happen in real time. It's going to take days or weeks using the original Kriegspiel system. Could you do it? Absolutely you could, but you're not going to like it. It's going to have too much downtime between the, terms, the turns. Highly impractical. So what we have done is we have figured out ways to gamify Kriegspiel. I developed my own system to gamify Kriegspiel called the Southern California system. Uh, we have a person who came through the organization who added his own modification to it called the Brigade System. Uh, we have other people who are also finding ways to improve and tweak the brigade system and other systems. So what we have essentially is we kind of have this blended system where we've taken the original and we've kind of uh, redesigned it, if you will, so that it plays faithful to the original Kriegspiel, but in a way that is convenient and actually fun, and we can play a game over the course of several hours to a day at most. So what makes a Kriegspiel a Kriegspiel? Uh, the essential elements are this. Number one, it has to be umpired. If you don't have an umpire calling the shots, playing God, making the decisions, then it is not a Kriegspiel. It's something else. 
Now, it could be a computer. You can have computer-run Kriegspiels. It's theoretically possible. AI being what it is isn't that great. But um, you have to have an umpire. Generally, it's a human, and it should be for obvious reasons. Uh, it is played double-blind, meaning the two sides don't know what's going on outside of their little bubble. They don't know where the enemy is or what the enemy is doing until they come into some kind of contact. So it's double-blind. The other element is it uses simultaneous movement. It's element number three. All of the elements must move simultaneously. That's why the umpire collects all the orders, and they sort of average out the movement on both sides so that, you know, this guy, you know, these guys want to move. Let's go ahead and use the map that we have here. So these guys, you know, let's say they want to move here, right? They want to move that far. And these guys in blue, they want to move this far in one turn. Well, that's just not going to happen, is it? For obvious reasons, because something's going to happen here. So what the umpire does is the umpire moves the pieces based on their movement allowance, but averages it out. Or they come into contact, and the umpire gives both players a report. You see the enemy, you know, to your front. What do you wish to do? How do you wish to react? And both sides then give orders you know, hey, we want to go into line or whatever, and we want to engage the enemy. So uh, that's what I mean by the umpire averages out the movement on both sides. That's what happens there, okay? So that's simultaneous movement. And number four, it emphasizes the fog of war. We've already talked about that. And number six, it features delayed communications and carrying out of orders. We've also already talked about that. So those are essential elements of Kriegspiel. So can you buy Kriegspiel? The answer is no. It's not even something uh, that's under copyright. It's not something that you would necessarily want to buy. Um, there are people with various systems. They may, um, you know, uh, sell you a rule book or something that they've created, and that's just fine. Uh, generally, systems like that tend to work uh, and can be used and, and are playable. Um, but for the most part, I don't know of anybody who is actually selling a particular system. Um, you can learn how to play Kriegspiel by joining the International Kriegspiel Society. We'll teach you absolutely for free. You can also watch these videos and uh, get your own game going. However, I would strongly advise you that you do so with somebody who is experienced with Kriegspiel because just having the rules to the game, which you can get the rules, you can actually buy them from Two Fat Lardies now as I think about it. Two Fat Lardies is a website in the United Kingdom, and they have digital downloads of the 18, oh, I think 24 and 1867 rule sets. I could be wrong, but I think they have those original rule sets. Um, and there are other rule sets and books that you can get and find online. But just following those rule sets isn't really going to teach you the practical elements of how to run a Kriegspiel. It will teach you the rules, but it won't teach you the things that you really need to know to be successful. It will just teach you how to roll the dice and run the combats. That's fine, but there's more to it than that. So you really want to have a mentor to teach you how to run these games before you start putting together your own game. If you try to do this on your own, you're going to run into a lot of pitfalls. You'll probably fail. The rules will go into the circular file, and you'll probably never pick it up again. So I'm, I'm just saying, a fair warning, uh, it's not as easy as it seems. It's easy to play Kriegspiel. It's not as easy to run it. So how does a Kriegspiel run? And it's going to look really, really easy to you here. We are, I'm going to illustrate what comes out of the brigade system here. Uh, we're going to take, uh, actually, I want a couple 10-sided dice here. And we're going to assume we have two elite units from both sides that are going to attack each other here. They're going to fire at each other, usually at closer ranges than this. Uh, but they're in contact, and they're going to engage each other. So the way we run it, and this is just one way of running it. It's not the only way to run it. You can run this in different ways. Different systems have different ways of doing it. But this is kind of how we tend to do it. Um, and that's just, uh, it's a fun system that, that works for us. So you have these, each of these guys are going to roll their respective dice at each other. 
and then we're going to apply the results. Let me see if, there we go. I'm gonna roll all the dice. And I changed the map on you when I was, there we go. Okay, um, I apologize for hitting the wrong button there and changing the map, but here we are, we have some results. And the original Kriegspiel dice had combat results in them, on them. In fact, there are little tables on each side of the dice, a little hard to read. You have to know which dice to throw and which table to read. Uh, what dice you throw depends on the relationship between the units. Which t line on the table to read depends on their range. Um, but uh, that's how you do it. Here, we've kind of abstracted everything and incorporated into the dice. So let's say these units fired at each other, and here are the results. Okay, I have here two hits. So let's say the 4th Battalion and the second battalion have taken hits. Ooh, that's bad. The fir uh, first battalion here has taken a hit. Look, I've got the fourth battalion out of line here. Fourth battalion gets this symbol, and that symbol for us is called disruption. And this here is a miss, okay? So let's talk about what these symbols mean. For us, the disruption symbol just means anything terrible that has happened to a unit to make the unit less efficient in combat. Maybe it suffered some casualties. Maybe some of the guys are wounded. Maybe they've, um, you know, maybe they've uh, burned up a lot of ammo. They're reduced in ammo, or more likely, maybe they've uh, fallen out of line or or gone through broken terrain. Anything at all. Maybe the officer took a bullet or something. Anything at all. It's all abstracted as disruption. And disruption does have an impact on the fighting efficiency level of the unit. But we'll talk about that. A hit, on the other hand, means a unit not only takes disruption, but it also takes casualties, and enough casualties so that the unit is reduced in size. And in fact, these blocks are different from the ones we normally use. But here it shows, uh, actually, I think that's a square, isn't it? So that's different. Um, some of these other blocks that we use, the unit actually gets smaller to reflect that it's taken a hit. And let me pull one of those blocks out just to illustrate it for you. Here is a, here is a block. I think that block is, is it locked? Yeah, it's locked. That's why I couldn't pick it up. Uh, let me show you the block. Here is a block, what happens to a block when it takes a hit. It gets reduced in size. We have on here the die that it throws. It's just one of the things that we use. And so you see how it got smaller. It took one hit. If it were to take another hit, it would also go down yet another size. Okay. Now, when a unit takes a hit, we reduce its size. And there are different ways to do this accounting. With this system, with these new blocks, the accounting is done differently. Um, but we also apply what's called a disruption token to indicate the level of disruption on the unit. And uh, red is the first level of disruption, orange here, or pink or salmon is the second level. And I'm put applying the second level here because I know that's theoretically correct for these units. Okay, so this unit here has taken a hit. I'm just gonna move it kind of back like they got staggered or something to illustrate they took a hit. And then these two units likewise the same. All right. And that's actually very straightforward and very simple. And even though I'm not using the exact correct blocks for this system, uh, you can very clearly see, hey, that's really interesting. That's kind of fun. Now, what is interesting here is these units that are disrupted, because they're disrupted, they roll a different die with different odds of scoring hits on the enemy that's reduced. And I'll just illustrate that real quick, and then we'll wrap up the video. I'll take a look to see if there's any questions on the live stream. I apologize. There we are. We should be back in terms of audio. Sorry, the headset is wireless, and it just gave up. It doesn't even warn you. What the heck? Uh, I need a headset that warns me. Anyway, um, 
where was I? I'm going to roll just, I'm just going to illustrate and then I'm going to take questions. And I apologize if anyone is posting in there and feels neglected. Uh, but I am going to take all questions in just a moment. I might not have anyone on the stream. I don't know if anyone's live or not. I'm not checking the stats. I'm concentrating on teaching everything here. So these, well, I, technically these are being thrown at the other side. So this side is throwing these dice at them. And these dice are being thrown at the other side. So he'll throw a red one. He'll throw an orange one. These don't look orange. They look salmon, right? And then I need one more tin-sided red one right there. Okay. So um, if you don't understand why, please just trust me why I'm throwing the dice that I'm throwing. Uh, it should be kind of obvious from the video, but if you don't, we'll worry about that later. Okay. It's just one system. And you can use any system. Some systems only throw one die for all of this. But let's go ahead and roll it. And here we are, okay? So this unit just took another level of disruption. So he's going to go down another state. He'll be throwing an even weaker die if he stays in combat. This unit here, what is that die right there? What is, okay, that's a hit. It was a cock die, very interesting. This unit here, because it took a hit, takes another level of disruption, and he's going to break because he's already taken two hits. We're just going to say he is breaking. Okay. Now, that is an umpire decision there to do that. But uh, I'm choosing to do that because he took, he got clobbered twice in a row. That's not something most units in that era would generally sustain, um, in my opinion. So there we go. As my learned opinion as an umpire, I'm going to imply that result, which sometimes umpires can do. Uh, blank, meaning it's basically a miss. A miss doesn't mean that all the bullets missed. It means that your fire simply did not produce an effect on the enemy that's noticeable. And likewise, another miss here. Okay, so let's take a look at what happened here. Okay, so here we have uh, a level of disruption here. He's going to take another level of disruption. There's a miss here and another level of disruption here. And so, once again, they'll be throwing even weaker dice. Now, you see yellow dice come out. Uh, but, of course, this unit here, which is losing a battalion, falling back, the whole unit might now decide, you know what, we're out of here. We are gone. We're done. But that's basically how we do it. And it's pretty quick. It's pretty efficient, even though it can be a lot of dice and a lot of accounting. And so that's just uh, how it goes. And that's why it takes a certain level of experience and expertise. If all of this is, is uh, not very clear to you to start with, don't feel bad and worry about it. We'll talk about it again in future episodes. Uh, I'll be uh, clarifying things and going into more detail. Now, real quick, let's take a look and just see if there are any anything here uh, in terms of the YouTube stream. Okay, I don't see any comments or questions. This video didn't get many viewers, but that's okay. I think people uh, who would mo most likely view this right now as I'm recording it live are members of the group. And the members of the group have their own stuff going on right now. And they know all these basics. But I hope this video has been informative for you and has introduced you to Kriegspiel and the way that we run it now. I assure you it's very, very fun. I know some of you are going to say, well, can we account for elite troops and special types of weapons and stuff? And the answer is yes, but I also want to warn you that adding these levels of minutia, as I call it, adding these levels of complexity does not do anything to enhance your enjoyment of the game. You'll have just as much fun with this game with everything kind of being basic and vanilla as you would if we really dressed it up. And the problem with minutia is it makes the turns run a lot longer so that's an issue so all right uh, that's all I have to say I do want to remind you all that we have a website the International Kriegspiel Society website is right here kriegspiel.org you can come here you can join our discord that's how you join the group and we also have a patreon account uh, let me pull that up for you and uh, I would encourage you to support us by 
selecting the $5 level. It's the only level. Uh, we're not greedy here, uh, but it does support the podcast and it supports the International Kriegsville Society. So thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, I'll put these links into the YouTube comments so that you have them. And I want to thank you for being here and supporting the International Kriegsville Society. And if you have questions, please comment or add them or submit them. And I will be very happy to answer them in the future. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.